of the show. But there we he go. found a way there to. There we go. I knew it. So you got you got something out of me, but my dad had a very high standard sure. because of his training right. that he never wanted to break up. He hated breaking up. I, Leslie will bear me out on this. Depending on who you ask on the 3,000 people that Leslie interviewed in three years, you can ask some people. They said they loved breaking up. My dad hated it because my dad was a classically trained actor who took pride in the fact that he was on script. And he considered amateurs to break up. And he hated it. Now, there are some people who found it interesting and fun because it made everybody, everybody more accessible. They weren't, doing, they weren't doing Playhouse 90. They were doing a variety show. Mm-hmm. So if you ask my wife, if you ask anybody, everybody has a different interpretation of how the breakup went. Yeah. Either it was a negative or it was a positive. But Wesley and I have gone around and around about this. And our friend Ed Robinson will say one thing, and we all have a different opinion about this. But my dad hated it because he thought that would tarnish his reputation of being a disciplined performer. And he hated himself. He would kick himself that he broke up. But, but uh, in your dad's defense, and we've talked about this before, a lot of it was caused by Tim Conway plotting his own little thing that nobody knew about. Tim would get in there and look at the sets that were involved uh, and look at uh, what was going on with the costuming when everybody wasn't aware with it. And he would check with the director and he would ask after the first show, the the dress show, when they they did the first taping, if everything was okay in the sketch. And usually the director said, yes, everything was fine. So then Tim would be, okay, I'm going to do a few unexpected things in the next one. So everybody was like, oh, boy, be on guard here, you know. And that was when Tim would put in some things that he improvised and uh, would, you know, kind of throw everyone off. And especially because uh, Harvey was so very much by the book, he was so dedicated in following the script, you know, he'd get something thrown at you that would just, anybody would naturally giggle about like he did at the same time, you know. But that was, you know, that was because Carol and and Joe Hamilton gave Tim the leeway to do that. And uh, like it or not, you know, they could have, you know, decided, okay, that was a little too much. We won't put that on the air. But nine times out of ten, they would let Tim, you know, do his thing. And that has even Carol has said, you know, some people have criticized the show for that as, as that uh, being its weakness, that everyone was cracking up all the time because of especially around what Tim's annex were doing. Wow. Well, you know, one of my favorite sketches from the show was when they would all be by the piano with their own individual instruments and play really bad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, that was the music. The music. Yeah, that I was you. That, that was from. Um, yeah. Mitzi and um, her husband. What was Kenny it? Welch? Yeah, Mitzi and Kenny Welch. Yeah, they came up with that idea. They were um, many people have with the show have fond memories of it because Mitzi and Kenny Welch were the ones who did a lot of the showstoppers on the show for the last six years, and um, they were really um, clever and inventive to how they how they um, got things going together. You know, um, uh, they would try and do. Um, you know, things like the, the Cinderella uh, with the Pointer Sisters, that was their creation. That was what they had gotten together there. Um, and the, the big challenge they had with the show sometimes is I think everybody agrees that they, they did a tribute to just about every singer-songwriter in the Great American Songbook um, beyond belief. You know, they, you've got medley <laughs> for everybody. You're like, oh, my gosh. We're going to have Irving Berlin. Of course we're going to have Irving Oh, boy, you know. There was that, um, you know, by the, I, don't, I, I think by the end of, uh, of the, I think by the end of the series, they were putting in some songwriters I'd never heard of. I don't think anyone had heard of Like, it's a tribute to Johnny, Johnny, or, what, okay, you know. So, um, you know, but that was, uh, uh, what, you know, that they, they the show just went through a lot of material that needed that, you know, to have the big show stoppers. If they didn't, if they didn't have like a, a two part movie spoof at the end, you know, then it would be a big uh, musical number. You know? I think they did universal 
Studios at least twice. Warner Brothers. Yeah, I figured out they 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 did a tribute to MGM during the last season. They did their third tribute to MGM with their third spoof of um, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. So that's <laughs> when I was like, okay, you guys are really running low on things here. So. Um, yeah, it got to the point where the MGM line was on Social Security. Oh my gosh, they they did at least they did at least two tributes to, to uh, Walt Disney. I mean, every every studio. Really? Yes, they did it. RKO. Oh. Every freaking uh, RKO. Movie. I remember. Yeah, Disney. They did um, like when you were three or four years old. They did. They got some of the characters from Disneyland to come and. Uh, in costume and be on the show when Carol came out as Peter Pan or whatever, you know, it was. I'm glad I was spared that. Yeah, but uh, it was it was it was nice. But like I said, yeah, they they made tributes to every singer songwriter, every movie studio, um, and uh, and Lord knows, I think they remember the commercial spoofs too. They did a lot of commercial spoofs. Oh my gosh. Uh, speaking of the um, remember during the week they would get into the studio, they would do the commercials without an audience. Mm -hmm. And there's a thing of, about uh, fish and chips, and my dad's playing the priest. Go on YouTube. This is the most blue in my father ever got. I, I can't use the language they used, but... This is public access. Any possible uh, dirty word that Carol could throw at my father, and my father could throw at Carol, they did it because they knew there was, no, there was only crew around. Yeah. So they could get as mean and as dirty as possible. Nice. I mean, like I said, I can't, I won't use that language, right. but um, <laughs> it was, yeah, I mean, uh, you have to remember, you spend five days with somebody, but by, the, by Friday, they've all spent five days with each other, and I think you get really comfortable with people that you really love. Things start coming out of your mouth that you probably shouldn't oh. say. Yeah, I think there was and, one, um, there was one yeah. in the last the last season when your dad wasn't there, but there was one uh, thing a commercial spoof she was doing um, with Vicky Lawrence, and Vicky Lawrence was playing a woman complaining about how Carol's household was going, and Carol said, "Oh, get off my ass!" And then everyone in the audience she was doing okay. live, and the audience laughed, and Carol's like, "I'm sorry, that just slept out naturally. I'm sorry." Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the only one that I think got, got past the censors was they were doing a mama sketch and they were playing sorry or something mm -hmm. yeah. and I had never heard this word before and if you can edit this out Yvonne God bless you oh, no. Vicky said a few things in the first sketch the, the first taping uh -huh. the second show the audi the writers loaded her up with some really juicy jokes references to the anatomy of a woman and somewhere, Vicky went off track. Wow. And she said, what is your problem? Are you writing the cotton pony? Yeah, is it your time a month, Eunice? Is, yeah. yeah, is it your time a month? Is it, you're writing your cotton pony? <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know. I've never heard that phrase before, but I don't think the CBS censors thought that was funny. Yeah, no, they played that one on the anniversary, on, I think the 2000 um, or 2001 anniversary special. They played that one, but... Um, they were able to play that that uh, um, censored version. They went with the uncensored one enough where she was, Vicky was saying, you're playing hockey with a warped puck, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, what about the money? <laughs> what had, like, did they, they, obviously, they couldn't have gotten, did they get residuals or, like, you know, what, what happened money-wise? Because they did the show for 11 years. Did they, were they set for life after this or, or just cash? Um, I'll let Chris speak to Harvey. I know that Carol did a very nice thing in that um, when they did the repeats, most of the stuff that was cut out were a lot of the musical numbers, but she made sure that there was a payment made to the dancers who appeared in those shows. And as a result, one dancer was able to um, buy a house, and he, he, he said this is the house that Carol built for him. That was... Uh, how much uh, appreciative uh, he was at the time there. Um, Joe had a reputation of having a tight buck when it came to talent, unfortunately. Joe would spend uh, money on greatest sets and everything. I remember the one 
there was one uh, sketch where, well, there was the, the pail sketch where uh, there were like yes. literally hundreds of pails coming out of the closet. There was another sketch where um, Harvey and Tim were on a ship and uh, Tim opens the door and gallons of water comes to drown him out there. You know, the, that was pricey stuff to set up. But when it came to talent sometime, um, he, he was tight with a buck. That's why uh, the last couple of years there were more um, family shows basically because he it seemed like he didn't want to um, pay money for them. And then um, there was also, when they went to, the, to syndication, um, the, the deal they had set up there was so bad that uh, Harvey was going to uh, make a formal complaint about uh, how they were going to be um, compensated for the reruns uh, until Carol intervened and, and told Joe, no, we're not going to, we're going to, do everyone fairly here and, and get that squared together. So it's amazing, like a lot of shows like that. Like I, I, I'm just thinking about the Gilligan's Island cast talked about that, that they don't get residuals, and it just seems a little, um, even though legally they don't have to, that like Carol's doing the right thing, and I'm surprised like other people. I guess I want to believe more people wouldn't do that. They had the money. It's not like they're broke. Yeah, but you know, some of them, you know, they just see only themselves on how yeah. they go there. I mean, I think if you by, to to a letter, everyone uh, connected with Carol Burnett's show has wonderful things to say about Carol. And when it comes to Joe, they're, well, he did what he had to do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they, right. Not as enthusiastic. Well, I mean, remember, when they went to Australia, only a handful of them went. Um, Carol, my dad, Vicky, some of the writers, some of the dancers had to go. They saved some money because, obviously, you can't take... 400 people with you. You can take only people that you are necessary to go. But they were there for a week. Yeah. Wow. And they had just redone the uh, Sydney Opera, Opera House, I think, a couple months before. And um, so Carol, my dad, Tim, Vicky, uh, Edward Volawa, the Italian ballet dancer, and um, and one another female dancer. Mm -hmm. But that was about it. And then maybe some of the writers got to go. And so that was the most, that's probably the most money Joe probably had ever spent in a week <laughs> yeah. in his lifetime. Yeah. But that wasn't the norm. But he did that because he realized it was, uh, that was the opening of the Sydney Opera House that they yes. had there. And it would also help the show with its overseas sales. You know, the show appeared there in Australia. It appeared in England, um, Canada, definitely, uh, South America. It, for a variety show, it got a, a, a Big uh, circulation uh, for its time there. Well, and that also goes back to the good cop, bad cop, right? So Joe was the tight one and Carol was the generous one, right? So they worked it out, right? So yes. there's a balance there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Carol could well, rely on Joe. If she wasn't, if there's something going wrong, she would let him know and he would be the one to tell people, okay, you need to change this or do that or that sort of thing and, and get it together that way, um, you know. Um, I mean, it's, yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say, as far as my dad leaving the Burnett show, that was that was one of the worst parts of last year, because yeah. what most people don't know this, and I told Wesley this, and most people, unless you watch the um, the Hall of Fame interviews with my father from 2002, I think, most people don't know this. He was offered the captain on the what boat role. Oh, I was just I gonna talk that. about that. That's so funny. Go ahead, please. Okay. That's so funny. That was the so, question. But, uh, backing up Wesley's claim, someone had gone over to ABC, uh, backing up what Wesley had said in the book. He went over to a lot of people and said, Harvey is good enough to do his own show. My dad wasn't sure. But he offered my dad a chance to do a couple of shows that will bring out his best versatility. So that's why I'll try it. In the time we're getting the writing stuff together for the Harvey Corman show, his agent was propositioned with, would you do the Meryl Steubing character? Right. And my dad said, well, one, I don't want to do eight-hour days. Ah. My knees aren't good enough for wearing those shorts. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, God for, and God for heaven, I don't want to cross-dress anymore. <laughs> and I certainly don't want to spend four hours with Ethel Merman. <laughs> yeah. um, well, she played Gopher's mother. Oh, yeah. I, didn't, oh I didn't remember that. Mm -hmm. So... Wow. Long story short, yeah. um, they had offered the role of my dad. Now, Bernie Coppell, who's on the lipo, ironically, is one of my dad's dearest friends. Wow. 
Now, Wesley could get this out of me because he knows more than this, this I do. Supposedly, Bernie was propositioned to do on the Burnett Show, and supposedly, from Sully Berman's interpretation, so is he. Mm-hmm. So, and then there was, a, it was bandied about maybe Ross Martin and a few other people, but she loved my dad because my dad was Carl Reiner to her Caesar. Right. Yeah. So, long story short, he went over to ABC and said, like, I don't want to do 12 hour days. I don't want to do 10 hour days. I, 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 you know, I love Aaron Spelling. I love Bernie. I love Ted Lance. I love all of them, but I don't want to do that. And he just come off working 14 years in a row between right. Danny Kane and the Burnett Show. Right. 14 years of employment, that's a lot. It, and, and remember, Love Boat is a one camera. Is it? It's light, we light, light, we light. We, that's all you do all day. So he said, I don't want to do 12 hour days. I don't, uh, that's not my thing. Now, ironically, my father did five or six Love Boats. Don't well, go don't figure, don't he, you know, he, he said, okay. but no, here's the thing. Once a year, Aaron Spelling, we take about 12 of them. We go on a great cruise together. So it was a free cruise, and you know, you tell a Jew you get a free cruise, they went for it. Oh, that's awesome. Do you feel a little sad that your dad didn't do the love boat because he would have made tons of money? Um, I I don't know. I mean, if you think about love boat and you think of the image of love boat had, I mean, I think you know Shakespeare. It wasn't even. uh, I would say. Yeah, well, I would say. I would have loved. Yeah. I I would say he might have loved it, the money, but I don't know. Sometimes the trade off is longer days. At his age, right, right. he was in his what? He was in his fifties. He was in his fifties. Fifties when he left Carol Burnett right. show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would do it now. Yeah, my dad was the oldest. <laughs> well, the other thing too is that Meryl, uh, what, uh, Gavin McCloud actually he read the script. It spoke to him. He thought this is good uh, or or yeah, worked. Yeah, yes. So it, it seems like it didn't speak as much to Harvey as it spoke to the person right. who ended up getting it. Right. It's like it just seems like. But did he also would he miss working with an audience versus the, with the one camera? Well, he just make a very good point. If you're doing one camera, you don't know if it's working or not because you don't get the immediate response to a, a, a three camera or a sitcom. You just have to go on your gut instinct that you have to you you have to wait a second and you take a beat, assuming there's a laughter. And here, and Leslie and I talked about this. There's so many shows that use canned laughter so much yeah. that the writers didn't have to really write yeah. great stuff. Yeah. And and there lies the problem with sitcom is the writers got to a point on the Burnett show where we don't have to write our best stuff because Tim will save us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. Because you have to assume the writers are going to write a seven-minute sketch. All seven minutes are going to be the best it can be. You can't assume that Tim's going to do something that's going to be so great that's going to save the writers. Right. Mm. That, Go ahead. Sorry. I'm on so I, I think Did your father you think with Barry Levinson writing the show and all the people that were on the show, they got a chance to shine. So I, I would think, you, and, and Wesley will bear this out of me, he has probably a lot of the writers, what they, what they felt about Tim upstaging their writing. Either it was a good time for them or it was a bad time for them, for their career, to have Tim play with their material. So, you know. But yeah, but getting back to what he was saying there, um, for uh, Harvey did do a situation comedy for ABC, the Harvey Corman show, but. Um, part of it was that they didn't schedule it that regularly. Um, they had some problems with, um, wasn't it casting his daughter that, that Christine Lottie was only on the first show and then they replaced her or something like that? Or? Actually, it was, uh, it was uh, what was that show? Was it Land of the Lost? It was a young woman named Susan Lawrence. Okay. And she didn't work out. And Christine Lottie was a nobody at this point. She was still a nobody. Yeah. And Barry Van Dyke, Dick's son was her boyfriend. Yeah. Now, now Barry Van Dyke, few... we should note, uh, is, of course, the son of Dick Van Dyke, and Dick Van Dyke replaced Harvey on, on Carol Burnett's show in the last season, of all things, you know, how weird this yes. thing is. And yeah. why didn't that work? He, so he was only in one season? Yeah, barely a season. Yeah, Dick was only on 12 shows. What happened was... When Harvey decided he was going to leave on the after the tenth season, 
Um, Carol made a deal. She had done uh, Dick's show, Van Dyke and Company, and had a good time improvising with Dick there. So she and Joe hit on the idea, let's add Dick Van Dyke and let's say let's bill him as a co-star to Carol because of his you know reputation that he had. Um, even though Van Dyke and Company had flopped in the ratings, it, it won the Emmy for Best Variety Series. So there was a belief <laughs> that it would work well, and he and Dick had. Uh, guessed it on Carol's show before, and they had a good rapport. But when he got there, um, to his chagrin, he learned he was getting the scripts that they were basically writing, that they'd been writing for Harvey, but forcing Dick to play them there. And Dick felt very uncomfortable and, 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 and you know, thought they weren't really writing to his talents. They were just kind of forcing him to play the Harvey's role in, in these sort of things. And uh, according to one of the writers, um, she said, or he said, I can't remember which one, I've got it in the book. Um, the, one writer said that after five shows, Dick wanted to get out of there. Um, and now, he stayed there, he honored his contract, um, but I think after the 12th show, he just he didn't show up, and it kind of surprised everybody, but they went ahead and um, in, ended up doing the last season just with Carol and... Vicky and Tim together, and, and there were a lot. There were a lot of things wrong with the last season. I mean, there was that they had some new writers who couldn't um, really write the best. They were uh, the show's quality actually went down some, I'd say, uh, considerably from what it had been. I think Harvey had cited had been very wise earlier in citing that as one of the reasons. He's like, okay, we've done the show for ten years now. It's been very good, but we're repeating ourselves with a lot of stuff. Yeah, but there's you, there's never. There are a lot of shows that you sometimes think, looking back, you're like, oh, they should have ended a year or two earlier, you know. They, like, um, you know, when they end up having, what was it, My Three Sons, where they ended up having Fred McMurray having a, a twin Irish or Scottish guy, and he had now was a grandfather of triplets, you know, and you're just like, oh, my gosh, you know, it's gotten so far away. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it was, it, 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 there were a few good shows after Harvey left, but it, I, I, like I said, it was like maybe one good show out of every four. It was not where it needed, and um, though Carol claims that CBS offered her another year, I think she was smart enough to know if, if they do that, they're going to put me on some time slot and cancel me in mid-season, so let me just bow out gracefully and, and, and end it this season. That would have been the original Jump the Shark. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think anyone can tell you I, w that Harvey was very integral to Carol's success there. You know, you don't – any show – that there were a couple shows where Harvey couldn't show up because of other commitments there. I think they had Kenneth Mars as a replacement one time and um, yep. others, and, and, and it just feels like uh, – it, it feels like you're eating a meal without the entree and maybe a side – vegetable you know there you know something is really missing here you know it's it's edible but it's not filling you know and that's what it, it really that's a, good, that's a good analogy Wesley that's a very good analogy yeah because Harvey did I mean it wasn't just what Harvey did on screen it's what he did off screen he he coached um, Vicky into learning how to maximize her comic timing and everything like that when Vicky joined the show she didn't even know how to um throw a purse onto a couch properly to the chagrin of Danny Simon, who was uh, stage and he was like, oh, my gosh. Uh, she basically got it because she looked a lot like Carol, you know, basically from what she had there. But he nurtured her, and she, she, she grew into a big talent that way and, and uh, got it together. And, and I showed Chris one time there was a sketch they redid that um, Harvey did with Carol, and then they had Lyle with doing the same role that Harvey did, and you're just like, well, Lyle tried, but he, he missed the nuances that Car that uh, Harvey's um, character got from the original. You know, it was just, he was very crucial because he was, he was simply one of the greatest second bananas television has ever seen. I, I've always said the three greatest are Art Carney, Carl Reiner, and Harvey Corman, and I, I, I think that that holds up. Absolutely. I can't argue with that because that's why what I would have said. Now, if you ask Carl, he'd say Harvey. If you ask my dad, he'd say Carl. Yeah, and I bet if we so, had Art Carney, he would have said both of those guys. They were, they were all modest, and right. all, 
And Art and Carl did do Carol's show as well, and they were great too. Right. Chris, what were yes. your favorite? What were your favorite sketches? One thing about what uh, Wesley said, then I'll tell you. If Carol said this, when if Dick wore a dress, it was Dick in a dress. If Harvey's wearing a dress, it's a character. Right. So if you think about that, and I, I asked her about this, she said. That's the difference between Dick and my father and everybody else's. Harvey turned a wardrobe into a character. It wasn't Harvey doing cross-dressing. It was Harvey playing a role. If Dick is, or Carl is doing the dress, it's Carl and Dick doing the dress. In the dress. So, but my favorite, uh, outside of what went with the wind, which is my favorite, um, there's one called Torchy Song, where she plays... John Crawford. Yep. And my dad plays this blind pianist. Nice. Um, the one that floors me, and, and I, I, I tease my dad about it, I loved, because I loved it, he's playing a ventriloquist in a dressing room talking to a dummy, and he's having a rhetorical argument with a dummy. I thought, this sounds really familiar. These are the same conversations he used to have with Tim. Talking to a dummy. There you go. Uh, because my dad always said, well, my dad, well, my daddy always said talking to Tim is like talking to somebody. He had the personality of a fern. Um, but my favorite, uh, I think anything with Carol, Carol comes into a bar. She's ready to end it. And they go back and forth about, let's see who can talk, whose relationships are worse. So my dad talks about his bad relationships. And they went back and forth. The worst part of that whole sketch is the, the wardrobe he's wearing in that sketch is wore, he wore to Thanksgiving dinner in 1978. Oh. Wow. It was a pumpkin shirt and a plaid pants. Oh, my God. He looked like he shot a couch out of Comfort Inn. <laughs> it was, and I, and I said to my mom, go watch that. Dad is wearing wardrobe from a 78 Thanksgiving dinner with your mother. I said, how do you lodge him in the house wearing any wardrobe from the Burnett show? Uh, Somebody should have shot him off. And so, but the thing, absolute my favorite, or anything with Carol, my dad, or Sammy Davis Jr. or Ken Berry. But my all-time favorite, and it's hard to pick one, but there's one with Joel Gray, my father, is two dogs in the pet shop. Oh, wow. And they play these dogs, and one is chosen over the other. And... Joel bites the, the person who bought them, and he throws Joel back in. And my dad and, Ch and my dad and Joel Gray sing as two dogs, as two best friends, and they sing a, like almost like a lullaby to each other. Wow! And the reason why I loved it was because here are two really great performers leaving their ear at the door and willing to be able to be childlike together. And you could see the, how much Joel and my dad loved working together. And for, you know, you can talk about the Emmy Awards, you can talk about ratings, you can talk about wealth and status. But when you watch two people that good at what they do, you really appreciate their talent. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I loved about my father is he came to play, Joel came to play, and... You know, I can still sit back and sit, say, you know, I can sit back and say this, that even if my father wasn't my father, he still would have been my favorite performer. Right, and I believe you. But the fact that I can say he's my father, you know, makes it better. It's like, I feel the same way about the book. I love the book, but I love it even better because Wesley wrote it. The book is great. <laughs> it's the Carol Burnett Show Companion by Wesley Hyatt. We're speaking with Wesley Hyatt and Chris Corman. We haven't seen your names in a while. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <we're gonna> <laughs> <laughs> what? Who? What? Who? What? Um, well, I, we're going to wrap it up, but guys, you, I mean. Yeah, we could go on forever on this. Th it's amazing. There's so much. Yes, we could. And a lot of it's in the book. Is there any other exclusive story, Chris, that you would like to tell us before we sign off? Um, that you haven't told anybody else. Well, uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, the pressure's on. Um, <laughs> the, oh, my God. Um, we were, my dad was doing a special, it was, it, it, 
it was a Mary Tyler Moore special, and it, it talked about the titles long. It's how to survive this, how to survive the seventies, and play, and even bump into a little happiness. And it was seventy seven. It was Mary Tyler Moore and my father John Ritter. Oh wow! And it was a love fest from the very beginning. And I never met Mary Tyler Moore. And I never had met John Ritter to that point. And to see all three of them work together. And Mary and I walked over, and mind you, I have, mind you, I have a speech impediment at the time. I still have one, so I wasn't really outgoing. And Mary came over and gave me a hug, and John was very really embracing. And it was like none of this, none of the things that have happened in my life, the people I've gotten to know, people like Wesley, like yourself, like would not happen had my father not been Harvey Quarm. And that is the true blessing of being Harvey's son. Now. Outside of that, the 10 years of cross-dressing, I could have done without that. <laughs> but I would never, I wouldn't have the blessing of knowing you, Yvonne, or Wesley, or Ed Robinson, or the people that are in my life now. Uh-huh. That is the true blessing, the legacy of the potential for me. Because I can count Wesley as like a brother to me. Wow. Oh, thank you. So, that's, that's, you know. Well, that's so, awesome. it's. That's, no, no. Listen, yeah, Russell and I really going to work together. I mean, I knew I'll, I mean to be his opening act. <laughs> <laughs> so Straight must opener. Be grateful to know Chris. <laughs> <laughs> you must be grateful to know Chris. So, yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah. Any uh, I'm glad, yeah. Yvonne, you, you connected on LinkedIn. Thank you for giving me, Wesley, the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, just so you know, the Financial Anniversary Special is December 3rd. On CBS from eight to ten. Oh wow! Oh, that's awesome. And uh, you know, so, we have a couple minutes. Did you want to talk about the? I I almost forgot. Well, the, the, really the, fast. It, yes. If you, it's Kristen Chenoweth, Jay Leno, Kevin Spacey, Bill Hader, Harry Connick Jr., Kevin Spacey, Berta Peters, Steve Lawrence, oh, uh, um, Vicky. <laughs> they taped it already. Oh John. well. <laughs> they taped it. They pre-taped it. Yep. And. I can honestly, and I can honestly tell you, um, Jay's segment about why he loved my father. There's a, a extended connection to that most people don't realize. If it wasn't for my father, Jay Leno would never gotten to tonight's show because my dad introduced Carson to Jay Leno. Oh, wow! Wow! Because my dad, at the time, well, still is, was one of the original owners and investors in the improv brand with Bud Freeman. And my dad brought Carson in one night, and Andy Kaufman from Taxi had just bombed. Oh, and Leno God. followed Andy Kaufman. Stories be true that he pulled, after the set was over, he pulled Jay over, and no one knew, Carson didn't go to clubs. Carson is so shy. Yeah. He would sit in there, and coordinators out there to scout comedians. So this is 75, 76. And um, late 80s, even, you know. And uh, my dad brought Carson one night, and they sat in the back, didn't tell anybody. He told Bud that he was coming in. He didn't tell who he was bringing in. So it, it was like a needle was dropped. Carson and my dad walk in. Do you hear a needle drop? Yeah. They sat in the back. Reno did his thing. And he tells that whole story. Pretty much, he said, if it wasn't for Harvey, I, w- I don't know where my girl would have been. As far as oh, night show goes, or my career would have been anyway. He was a good so, guy, man. It, he was a good guy. So, uh, <laughs> wait, you know, I want to, I don't know if we're, I, I was trying to do some research. We kind of want to end the show by um, singing, we're so glad we had this time together. Are we allowed to do that? Uh, yeah, I think it will. It's a, yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> as far as I know. Only Thomas Paul people will see this. <laughs> <laughs> well, <and laughs> give it a shot, and if, if, if someone complains, you can cut it out. You know, later on. So yeah. Because you, yes. you can't get you can't get blood from a stone. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and and before we go, I, again, I want to thank you guys. Your wonderful uh, like information from all our childhoods. Great stories. Great stories. Well, wonder, they're all saying wonderful. I even got Gerard here. He doesn't always like to come on the show. So. That's not true. Well, this one, this one I was very excited about. It was very, very, very excited. It was very yes. exciting. Well, your other books, too, Wesley, by the way. I yes, saw the time. I was like, oh, my God. 
soaps and adult contemporary songs. Yes. Yes. Well, we right need to get alley. into that. If you guys ever want to yeah. come back, I'd love to have you back on the show. Um, well, I'd love to do that. Yeah, if anyone checks out, just look up uh, Wesley Hyatt on Amazon, W-E-S-L-E-Y-H-Y-A-T-T, -E and you'll see my other books. I've done, this one was my eighth, and I'm currently wow. getting ready to do a ninth one about Bob Hope's television career, and that should be pretty exciting and extensive as well. well. I can tell you, Joan Rivers didn't like Bob Hope, so I... Yeah, of course, that. That's what she said. Make sure you, <laughs> and make sure you put some well, Carson, supposedly. Uh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Carson didn't like that yeah, that's true. <laughs> and a lot of those guys weren't great for women. But yeah. whatever, so they were very talented. With that said, Phil, with that crank said, up the... Ready, uh, Phil? Are we ready? Yes. You ready? And I'm ready. One, and a two, and a three, and go. We're, We're so, so glad, glad we had, had this time. This time we were together. Just to have a laugh, just to have a laugh, sing a song. Sing a song. <laughs> Seems sing we just yeah. get it. Seems like we just and before, and before you know, you know it, comes the time. It's the time we have, have to say, say so, so long. Thanks everyone. Thanks for watching the Unknown Zone Talk Show. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. You guys. Great. You guys are great.